Imagine you have to read on the line an article of maybe 13 to 16 pages only for you to realize at the end that mm, this doesn't speak to my topic. Now you've wasted two to three hours reading an article that will not even be relevant for your work. You've highlighted, you've, you know, uh, make comments, you've, um, you know, engage with the reading without even knowing if you will help answer your question. So you don't want to do that. So this stage will avoid or will prevent you from really wasting time reading something that will not be useful to you, okay? So once you've scanned through the introduction, abstract or conclusion, you've looked at the heading and you feel it's relevant, then you can save it under useful. And if it's not relevant, you can save it under not useful, all right? Now, for the next stage, you will go into the folder of useful documents, right? Then you will start the next stage of your reading, which is question. So with this stage, what you want to do with the question stage is to ask questions. So here you ask practical questions of um, your topic. So you could... Um, use past questions as well, past question papers to ask questions. So let's say you're reading for the exam and there's a textbook that you need to read for the exam. So you could use the, those past questions to ask questions that you need to find answers to in that specific textbook, right? Or you could create your own questions. So you kind of self-test yourself. So let's say um, um, the heading of whatever you're reading is about the Revolutionary War. And the question, what you want to look for is the causes. So the question could be, what are the causes of the Revolutionary War, right? So in reading, you'll be looking for answers to that specific question. What are the effects or the consequences of the Revolutionary War? Who were the main players during this war or the main characters during this war, right? So um, what were the main characters or main players during this war? You know, when did the war begin? When did the war end? So you, you can create your own questions or use past question papers. Now, this is important. In academics, we don't read for like we read um, fiction. When you take a novel and you're reading for pleasure, um, it's just fictional, um, you know, it's different. You, you read and you don't have to engage. You don't have to ask questions. You you want to know about the action, the plot, you know, um, just almost like you're watching a movie. There's a lesson at the end, but you don't need to answer specific questions. But when you're reading for academic purposes, the strategy is completely different because at the end of the day, you have to answer an assignment question. You will have to write tests. You, write, you have to write an exam, right? So you can't just read as if you read a novel. That is why we're using the SQ4R. Okay, so I can see that um, three more students have joined. I will just ask if you could please just get a, a, a note a pad or if you can take notes somewhere. And what we will do is we will, at the end of the reading strategies, I'm going to ask you to, um, kind of share, I will say, for example, what I will ask the question, what is the first stage? What does it require you to do? What is the main thing that you have to do for that specific stage? You can unmute your mic and share, or you can share in the chat for me. So I'll just repeat the first stage for those who just um, came in. So the strategy we're using today is the SQ4R, which I believe is one of the most effective strategy that will help you um, get information out of your textbook that will allow for comprehension, understanding of your specific text and will help you remember what you have read, right? So the SQ4R stands for the different stages in your reading, right? So S for survey, the first R for, um, sorry, Q for question, the first R for read, and then we have um, respond, and then we have record, and we have review, SQ4R, right? And before you start reading, choose a location that is comfortable for you, an environment that will allow you to really read and understand. So choose a comfortable environment. Then I started with the survey. I'm just going to Rabashi, sorry, I'm just... Um, 
going, I'm just kind of, you know, others should catch up a little bit. Um, so the survey, I'm advising you to uh, unpack your question, get the main things, and then when you go to Google, do your research quickly, and whatever article pops in, open a folder that says general, download all the articles that come up, save it under general, then have a subfolder that says useful and not useful, okay? Then you can start with your survey. Now, the survey is the stage where you skim and scan through your work. So no reading involved here, no deep reading yet, no engaging, no questioning. Just glancing through, you know, that article to check for the relevance. Is this relevant for my assignment question? Is this relevant for my module, for my test, for my exam, depending on what you're reading for, right? Focus on the introduction, conclusion, abstract, if there is one. Why? As we saw yesterday, these three areas are summaries of the entire body. You don't want to read the body for two, three hours, and then at the end, just to realize it's not relevant. This thing speaks to a different context, or it's not even talking about, you know, my specific area. It's not important after you've taken three hours to engage with it. So the skimming, the survey helps you to really avoid wasting time on things that are not relevant. So you want to skim through introduction, abstract, and conclusion to check for the relevance of that textbook or article. If it's relevant, you now save it on the useful folder. If it's not relevant, you save it on the not useful. All right. So when you start your reading, you will now go into the useful folder and start with the Q, which is questioning. And I think uh, you all um, uh, were here already when I started the questioning. So once you've questioned, the next thing you want to do now is to start your reading, okay? So this is the place where you will now deeply engage with your article. So it, you've, you've, you've determined it's useful. So now you want to read and engage. So you no longer just came in the way you did with the survey. You want to now start looking for the answer to those questions that you ask in the Q stage, in the previous stage. Um, you can um, use your highlighters. You can use your pencil. Now we have different types of learners. We have your visual learners that really love to see those colors. It helps them to focus. And we have other learners that when the text is too colorful, it's kind of distracting to them, right? So depending on the kind of learner that you are, you can use your highlighters. You can use your pen, your pencils. You can highlight, you can make small notes next to the question, or you can have a different book or paper where you actually have your questions. And in reading, if you see an answer to the question, you can actually write it under your specific question. Um, on the actual article, you can underline it. If it's online, you can also highlight on PDF documents online. You can also make notes on PDF documents online, right? If you are struggling with that, you can just contact your library to see if they can help you or your tutor to see if they can help you with how to highlight on PDF documents and make notes on PDF documents. Um, that is, if you haven't printed these documents, um, it's still possible to do this online, right? So this is where you will now look for um, um, the meaning of difficult words. Now, I just want to mention something when it comes to this. Um, when you read, and especially articles, academic articles. Now, in, in academics, you know, some there's different types of writers. You have writers that really use a simple language. So you, you read and you understand. And then you have other academics that use really difficult vocabulary. And it's difficult to really read and understand. So what I'm saying here is you don't want to really research every difficult word in the dictionary. You may find yourself reading, taking six hours just to read a specific article. So if you have an article, you feel like the language is too difficult uh, for you to understand, try to see if you can research for another article. Because mostly you will find out that there is a lot of authors speak about the same thing. 
But if you truly want to use that article and let's say it's a prescribed article or textbook and you have to use it, then what you could do is you could read another article written in a more simpler language that would then help you to understand the current article better. That is one strategy. The next thing you could do is check if that topic has been written on Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia is not an academic source, but it can help you to understand a specific topic because it's mostly written in a simple language. It can help you to understand so that when you come back to your actual article, you're able to understand better. Thirdly, you can also YouTube. Sometimes there are lectures on a specific topic um, that will really help you understand your current article. OK, look for summaries if there's been summaries of that specific article online, you know, to help you understand. Now, you only go to the dictionary if a word impedes understanding. So you're reading an article and there's a difficult word, but you understand the sentence. Keep going. Right. You don't have to understand every word. You only go to the dictionary if you feel that it's a specific jargon. Jargon are words that are specific for certain disciplines. So if you're reading and you find a jargon and you've realized, hmm, there's this word, it's always popping up in most of the articles that I read and the lecturers is uh, constantly mentioning this, then you want to look for the definition of that specific jargon because it's in your field. So you will constantly see it. But if it's a word that you feel like it's difficult, but I still understand the sentence, keep going. Otherwise, if you have to look for the definition of all difficult words, you could take a long time, except it's a word that you're specifically drawn to. So you really just want to know what it means. So please feel free to go to the dictionary. All right. All right. So once you have highlighted all important sections, you have found the answers to your questions and uh, look for any difficult material or gauge with another article for further understanding. So what you want to do now is to start respond responding. So the next stage is now for you to respond, right? So the difference with respond and record, the only difference is we respond, I advise you to do it orally, right? Then with record, I want you to write it down. So you found the answers by highlighting, you know, you found some of the answers. So what you want to do is to respond to them orally. Now, when you read, what you're trying to do is to engage your different senses. There's the visual, there's the kinetics, touch, right? There's the auditory, listening. So you want to really engage as many senses as possible. So these different stages will allow you to do that. So the first time you're reading, right? And then with this stage, you want to then speak it out, right? So when you speak, research has shown that, you know, teaching, when you teach, you learn. And teaching takes place orally. You speak it out. So the more you say something, the more you will remember it, right? So... Don't be shy. You know, some people are shy to speak to other people. That is why, you know, um, they're scared maybe with debates, presentations. But if you are reading, you're in your room, you're in your own space, you know, that means you can really talk to yourself in the mirror or you can take your phone and record yourself, right? So speak, speak it out, talk, answer these questions in your own words, right? And in, on Saturday, please make time. We're going to be looking at note taking, how to take notes, paraphrasing, how to turn things in your own words and summarizing, which also involves putting it in your own words, which is the major skill in university. You have to be able to put things in your own words, the way you understand it. OK, so on Saturday, we'll be addressing that from eight to, to 10, I think. All right. So. In your own words, you want to respond to this question. Firstly, because it will help you remember the information more, especially in tests and exams, but also because you can really go back and listen to your recording and see if you really answered it correctly. You know, going back, checking if you answered it correctly and, you know, just saying it in when you think about that, when that question comes in the exam, you'll be able to quickly respond, right? So record yourself orally. Speak to yourself. If you are in a study group, you know, the response stage could involve you responding to these questions orally within your study group, okay? We are also going to have a workshop this month on how to 
um, have effective study groups and working in groups, right? So you want to do this within your groups, or if you have your brother or sister that you study with, you can, you know, respond orally to them and they can respond to you as well. Um, so if you prefer to respond to someone, a friend, a brother, study group, you can do that, or you respond to yourself in the mirror and record yourself. Recording is important so that you can always go back to double check if you actually responded correctly. But if you're responding to a friend and uh, or a, a colleague, then they can check to see, you know, if you actually responding correctly. Then the next thing now is you want to write it down. So once you're able to respond to that question orally, correctly, then you can now record it on your summary notes. So the next stage, which is the record stage, now involves you to write down that information on your notebook or flashcards. So you can make summaries using your summary notebooks, right? Uh, we'll look at this on Saturday, how to make take effective notes. So you can take your notes in forms of summaries, or you can then use your flashcards, or you can do both. I actually advise you to do both because if you take small notes and then you transfer it to flashcards, flashcards are brief. They are more brief. They are summaries of your notes and you can walk with your flashcards. You can be in the public transport, you know, you're sitting there and just going through your flashcards or you can be at the queue in the bank and you just go through your flashcards because it's, it's, it's easy to carry, right? So after writing them in your notes, you can then summarize them further using your flashcards, okay? Once you have recorded them using your hands, now you've engaged the speaking um, and the listening, you've engaged the writing, you've engaged the visual, which is your eyes, the reading, now you can start reviewing. So this is the last stage which will involve reading your notes again and again till you write that test, till you write that exam, or till you answer that assignment question. So you will keep reading again and again. And the review stage um, also involves going back to the original article. So it's not just reading the summary and the flashcards, but let's say that something, and you're reading your notes and it's like, I think I'm missing out on something, or there's something that is not clear on these notes that I'm not understanding. You can then go back to the original text to check if, you know, you can read that section again, double check understanding or gauge further understanding of that specific context that you appear to be confused of, right? So this, you will do this again and again until you are confident about what you are reading. Okay. All right, so what I will do since uh, there's Koketsu and Rabashi, what I will do is I'll give you five minutes. What I want you to do is to, you know, just tell me what the stage, the stages are and what it's required to do. So you can do that in the chat. So you will say survey equals to scheme for understanding. The next one, you write it down, you say what it requires and so on. So just write what the stage is and what it requires you to do. Right. So let's take five minutes for that. Let's say it's uh, 1527 right now uh, at 1535. Um, so let's just take about seven minutes um, to do that. And then we can carry on with the writing practices. OK. So what are the reading stages? You name it and you say what it requires you to do. Please share that in the chat and we'll continue with today's session. I hope you can see the slide. It has a summary of the, the stages. All right. So very correct, uh, Rabaji. The first stage is to really just skim through the text to get an understanding of what it is. So is it relevant to your question? Excellent. Next is question. Q for question. Excellent. Where we must make a list of questions to focus our reading. Well said. Perfectly said. So. With this stage, you can also use past question papers or you can make up your own questions because when you read in academics, you read to look for answers for questions. You need to be guided. It allows you to be able to take out the necessary information from that specific reading. And then the four R's stands for read, recite, 
relate and review. All right. So um, reading, you will then start looking for the answers to the question asked in the previous step. Excellent. So the questions you ask, what are the answers? Right. And then recite is now where you now uh, kind of respond orally to whatever answer that you have found you now start responding to those questions orally record yourself do it within groups or speak to a friend or a brother a sister someone you study with or in your room your mirror you record yourself right and then the last one is where you now review the information you keep um, going back to it again and again you know to really um, understand the information more deeply to be able to answer your questions well in the exam, in the assignment, or in the test. Excellent, uh, Rabashi. I can see that you have indeed understood the different stages of reading, and I hope that um, uh, Priscilla has also gotten, you know, a summary of how you need to go about reading for um, your exams, the tests, or the assignment. And of course, the session is recorded. So if you need a copy of the recording, Priscilla, you can, it will be shared once ready. Uh, uh, also, you can request for a copy of the presentation from me. So now that we have gone through our reading stages, thank you so much, Rabashi, for your contribution, for your participation. Now let's look at writing practices. Okay, so we're going to look at the best ways to approach an assignment question to how do you write an assignment? And then we're going to look at best ways or strategies that you can use in preparation for your exams. Okay. So an assignment will be that task uh, that you are given, you know, uh, in your uh, uh, as part of your studies in this case. Um, and what is important with assignments is that you start early. And now the mistake that students sometimes make is to start, you know, two days before the, the date of submission or the day before to do an assignment. Now, the challenge with that is you will not give yourself, number one, enough time to go through the SQ4R, right? And then to now start um, writing your assignment, as we'll see, it involves different stages and you may not be able to go through these stages in a day. And that may lead to, you know, you not having the marks that you desire. You may still pass, but perhaps you wanted a 70, an 80, a 90. Um, so having enough time to go through all the reading stages and the writing stages will really help you get the most from your assignment. So you want to start as early as possible um, to give yourself time to go through all those stages, right? Which are, you know, your, the planning stage, the research stage, the writing stage, and the review stage of or stages of your assignment. So when you want to start your assignment, writing your assignment, the first thing is to understand the task, the assignment question. So what is this question about? So the first stage is to understand the assignment question. So before you start your assignment, make sure you understand what it's asking you to do. So read the question and then slowly and carefully, and then you want to ask yourself, What's the question about? What is this topic? Right? What is the main topic of this question? What does the question mean? What do I have to do in this question? Right? So try to find answers to these three questions. What's the question about? What's the topic? What does the question mean? What do I have to do? Then you can try to rewrite it using your own words. So you can say, for example, this assignment is about, the topic is about, I have to do one, two, three, and four. The question means this. So you want to write down in your own words and that will help guide you. That will help you to focus on exactly what is needed, right? About that specific question. And, you know, it, at this stage, if you have any confusions, you can, you know, look at your course materials. If you have WhatsApp groups um, or you have uh, discussion groups online or in your class, you know, talk channels, you know, or your tutor or your lecturer, just to, you know, double check that you have really understood what the question is about. You can do that before you move on to the next stage. 
Um, the other thing or the second thing you will do then after asking those questions is to start analyzing the question. So how do you analyze your question? So um, we will look at this more tomorrow. We'll dive into more detail with this tomorrow. But it's really about, you know, looking at the instruction words or what we call tax words. So when the question says you need to analyze, what does it mean? Right. It means you need to examine the main ideas and issues of a topic. Look at the arguments for and against. If the question says describe, it means you need to explain and explore the meaning or main features of something. If it says discuss, it means you need to examine and analyze the key points and possible interpretations. If it says evaluate, it means you need to give an opinion using evidence on the strengths and weaknesses of something. So if I have a question and I say discuss, it means I'm expecting you to give me arguments for and against. If I say um, illustrate, it means I need to see some drawings, some figures, tables, and so on. So already my tax word is telling you how I want you to go about answering a specific question. So what I would advise you here is to go online and just Google instruction words. But tomorrow's workshop will also have some of those words. But it's better you have them on a PDF document. So if you Google them, you'll be able to have a list of these words and what it requires you to do. And just read through them and really just get to understand what these mean. If it's an assignment, you can always Google immediately. What does this course mean, right? and you will get an answer. But if it's in the exam and in the test, you might not have access to online or your reading material. So it's important that you understand what these words mean, right? But don't get um, anxious that you're not really able to understand all of them. It, learning takes time, right? Uh, with time, you will get to understand them, but also, uh, note that the other aspects of the question can also guide you to know what to do. The instructions can guide you to know what re is required of you. So after you know what the task word is, you then want to look at the topic. So the what of the question. So what are you discussing? What are you analyzing? What are you illustrating? So the main area or topic of your question, the what, right? Then once you know the what, the limitation. So the limitation words is basically how far you can go with the question. Now, a question can say, um, discuss the, like the one we did on, on, on Monday, right? Um, discuss the causes of poverty in Africa. The limitation there is causes. We're talking about only the causes, but also, Africa, right? So you're not expected to discuss the causes of um, war, uh, of poverty, maybe in Asia or in America or in Europe, right? It has limited you to a specific continent, which is Africa. A question that says, like the one again on Monday, the other question to discuss the effects of um, technology use in higher education. Right. So first limitation is effects. So you will just be focusing on um, the negative and positive consequences of technology in higher education. And then the next thing is higher education. So you will not be talking about the use of technology in primary school or in secondary school or at creche or kindergarten. Right. You will be focusing specifically on those within higher education. So the limitation is really how far you can go with that specific question. We'll talk more about this tomorrow with some examples. Okay, so tomorrow we're providing some more examples. So because tomorrow we're doing unpacking questions and study strategies, which is an extension of today's workshop. So tomorrow, uh, sorry, today, after you have analyzed, you know, understood the question, analyze it. Now, before you go to the next stage, which is the research stage, um, check the marking schedule also to see what the marker will be looking for. Now, this just helps you to see how to answer that question. Um, 
it will help you to know what to focus on, right? So the marking schedule usually gives you an understanding of exactly what the lecturer wants, right? Um, check how much the assignment is worth, also the percentage, you know, um, the final mark uh, before you decide how much time to spend on it and how much you need to write on that specific, as specific assignment. You don't want to write, you know, an assignment of, you know, um, maybe use 15 articles for um, an assignment of five, Five, um, five marks or 10 marks, right? So usually the, the marking guide, the assignment instructions will tell you how many words you need to use for that assignment, uh, if it's 50% or 20%. Um, so it will really also guide you on the structure of your assignment so that you know exactly how to go about it. So um, then um, once you've check you know those that assignment guide you can now start um researching writing your drafts okay so you start your research so what you want to do is to gather the information around this question okay so once you're clear about what you need to do right you need to then start um, researching, you know, what exactly you will use. So what is the assignment topic? What information do you already have? So the information you might have is that from the lectures, for example. Um, it could be from your reading. Let's say you're a student that reads as you go. So from the start of the year or the semester, you've been um, attending lectures. So that is one information you have. Um, you've been taking your notes, you've been reading some articles already, and you've been making your summaries. Um, so check what information you already have for the topic. Then you only go researching what you don't have because you don't want to just dive into researching and then realizing, oh, but I did this in the lectures. I already have summary notes for this. I've already read about four articles around this question and highlighted and I have my notes and everything. And now I just need to write, you know, cause once you, you have all the information, you can then skip the stages and go straight to your writing stage. But if you haven't uh, done research yet and you don't have any material, then you need to um, start research. Or if you have some and you need more, then you need to know what do I have and what do I need to research? Right. What extra information do I need right, to respond more effectively to this assignment task? Then once you've done that, the next thing is try to brainstorm on the information and you can use a mind map for that. Right. Um, all right. So you can use your mind map um, to brainstorm. So what uh, will be needed in the introduction, what will be needed in paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, how many references do you need for this assignment from the marking schedule you looked at before, um, the assignment instructions, you know, you will need, you will know, do I need 15 articles, um, does the assignment say 10 articles, five articles, and so on, you will then be able to know that I have three, I need two more, Right. Then you structure your work for each paragraph. I'll need two references. So I'll have four paragraphs. That means I'll need this number of references and so on. Then you can already start developing your structure, which will guide you to write that assignment. Right. Um, before you even do your research, you need to also think about where you will get your material from. Will you check? Uh, check your course material, your, your tutorial letter. Uh, is there some information there that would be useful? Um, you know, um, check your recommended readings. Um, go to your online library to see, um, to research these articles. Go to your physical library um, to get some books if need be. Um, ebooks, check online for ebooks, you know, and then. Um, research databases, journals, to try to get some material that you will use for this reading. So think about where do I get this material, right? Is it Google? Is it your online UNISA uh, library? Is it eBooks? Will you go to the actual library to get some of these books? So develop that strategy, right? Now, if you're searching online, um, so on the online databases or um, you'll be using um, uh, the ebooks, uh, Google uh, or Google Scholar, 
if these are the, the search engines that you'll be using, um, you then need to think about the search tips. So what you don't want to do is to copy the question fully and put it on Google or put that question fully on your online library. You might not find answers. So what you want to do is to underline the keywords in that question. You already did that when you were unpacking the question. So copy those keywords and put them in the search engine engines to look for material or you can develop shorter questions so smaller questions from the big question you know or rephrase it break it down let's say um um you're discussing the effects of um the use of technology in higher education that's your question so you may want to say effects of technology right just that um, or you may want to say positive effects of technology, negative effects or consequences of technology. Try to also change the word. Sometimes some articles will use effect, others will use consequences, others will use uh, um, you know, maybe other words. You can look for synonyms. So use different words to do research. It will really help you to generate more articles. So effects of technology then you can see um, consequences of technology. Then you can break it down, positive effects of technology, negative effects of technology. Then you can go further to say um, um, positive effects of technology in higher education. Now you can start going more specific, right? Um, but guess what? Just by taking out higher education, um, you will get more articles. And within those articles, when you're doing the survey, you will then be able to check for your own specific context. So articles that talk maybe about uh, primary, you will take them out and then you can focus on higher education. Then you will now look for effects of technology in higher education. And then from there, um, you will get more articles. Then you can also in that question say the use of technology in education, right? Because when you say the use of technology in education, you will, you will get some people who focus on that, but then they're able to discuss the effects within that article because it's usage. They may explain its usage and then ex explain the reasons why they're using it and then also discuss the positive and negative impacts of using it in education. So just by having the use of technology in education, you will get some at some useful articles as well. So you will see that from that one question, I have developed, you know, um, how many? It's the, the use, the effects, positive, negative, you know, and then with the higher education, I've, I've asked five different questions that will get me more articles because sometimes what makes it a student will say, Queen, I am not look, I'm not finding articles online. It's not about, it's not that there are no articles, is the way you ask those questions on Google or on your online library that is limiting you in terms of the article. You could even go further to say technology, technology use. You will see they'll talk about technology use in companies, and then you just go and look for the one that says education. So you can just say technology use. That could work, right? Or technology. You could even go further if you are not finding articles, right? So you keep bringing it down and down until you're able to get as many articles as possible. Okay. And in getting them, focus on the limitation, right? So the articles will pop out, but your focus will be on those within higher education. All right. So once you've gotten those articles um, that you're going to use for your assignment, uh, what you want to do then is to evaluate those articles, especially articles gotten from Google. Now, you will not need to evaluate the articles gotten from the articles you got from your online library, the UNISA library. Everything in that in those databases are academic articles. So you will not need to use the crap to check if it's crap, right? <laughs> So um, if, however, Google Scholar as well, all the articles on Google Scholar are academic articles. The only challenge with Google Scholar is sometimes you may need to pay for it, but also check with your library. There's a way to link Scholar to your UNISA library. Check if there's a way to link those two. Sometimes you're able to access them using your UNISA library accounts, okay, if they are for payment. Um, so your 
physical library also obviously is, is all the books that do, do not need to be evaluated, the academic sources. So Google, however, has non-academic sources. So you need to use the crap to check if it's academic. Now, why am I doing this is because most assignments will tell you to use academic sources. With most assignments at university, um, some sources are not allowed, for example, Wikipedia and some um, blogs uh, may not be accepted. Um, some websites may not be accepted. OK, so you need to really check if, you know, those sources are academic. So most academic journals are academic. So when you see a journal article, usually you don't need to use the crap. Those will be mostly academic, except um, there's too many and you want to use the crap to know to to use the most relevant. Right, then you can look for A, the authority. So who wrote it? You can then start focusing on the authority. That is, who wrote this specific book? Uh, is this somebody prominent in my field? Then you can focus on them more and then, you know, disregard the others. This is when you have a lot of articles and you don't know what to choose from. Now, when you have an article and you're unsure if this is an academic article or an academic source, then you can use your crap, right? So the first thing is you want to check if all of your articles for your assignments are current. Now, mostly um, lecturers prefer you to use books within 10 years, not only lecturers. At university in general, um, it's preferable to use books within 10 years. So you don't want to use books that are outdated okay so if it's a prescribed textbook go for it right if you have to research articles use the most current one if there's one for 2020 go for it 2023 24 the most the more recent the better okay but if you're unable to find articles uh, within 10 years then you can use the older ones try to justify it in your writing somehow right um, sometimes you say a lot has not been written about this topic in the recent years already when you make a statement like that it's clear that most of the articles might be above 10 years right um alternatively um some lecturers don't really limit you and um, you can use any please always double check this with your lecturers or your tutors if you are allowed to use books that are above 10 years uh, that is especially if you're not finding them just if there's a way communicate with them let them know and ask them if it's okay, you know, to do that. Um, all right, so check if it's current and then, um, sorry, and then you want to check if it's relevant. So uh, does the information answer your question? Um, is it the appropriate academic level? Now, there's some articles that, you know, may not be relevant for your specific level or they're talking about it more for, you know, a, a different audience, not really for academics. So you need to check, is this um, a text that is, you know, out for your level for academics, for students? Then check the authority. Who wrote the book? Usually if you Google the author on, you just Google the author, so you put their name on Google, um, information about the author will pop. You know, they will tell you if this person is an, a lecturer, if it's an academic, if it's a researcher, a writer, and so on, or a blogger, a publisher, and so on. Then you'll be able to check, go for academics, who write for academic purposes, for lecturers, um, HODs, you know, researchers, and so on. Once you know the authority, um, also, in terms of authority, some websites also work, like websites that are edu are usually for education, you know, uh, purposes, statistics, SA, you know, uh, big uh, organizations like uh, the UNICEF, um, the United Nations, the World Health Organization. So these are also good authorities. OK, so authorities are not always individuals. Um, is the source reliable? So you check for reliability. Um, if you look at the article and you can see that how did they collect their data? So did they collect their data through um, interviews? Was it through questionnaires? Uh, was it through personal observations or um, anecdotal evidence, secondary evidence? How did they collect their data? It has to be collected through one of these above mentioned, right? Um, for it to be academic. Um, that means I need to have 
use surveys. I needed to have used questionnaires, um, interviews, uh, personal narratives, observations, or secondary sources. So use other articles. Um, if it's about, you know, um, my personal opinion is a blogger just giving their opinion on an issue that may not be academic, right? Um, if it's for, um, let's say um, it's biased, you know, it may not be academic or just for purposes of advertising. So how do they collect their data? Collection of data will make it academic or not. What is the purpose? Is the purpose to advertise, as I've just mentioned. Usually academic books are meant to inform, right? Um, they're not there to entertain like um, creative books are. Um, they're not meant, you know, to persuade, to sell, uh, but this is it's really focusing on facts, right? Not opinion. It's 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 um, neutral, um, not emotional, right? You will not find a lot of emotional um, kind of language in those academic books. So they're usually neutral, factual, and they're there to inform, you know, the readers about a specific topic, right? Um, then you also need to use your critical thinking in analyzing. So after you've used the crap, just think critically about the text, right? And thinking critically is just thinking about really need checking for, you know, um, if you it's relevant. Is it, are you able to understand the arguments? Are you able to reach at your own conclusions? Are you able to analyze it? So just analyze it and see for yourself if it's relevant. So once you've used your crap, and you know that, you know what, um, this article is relevant, you want to start planning. So at this stage, you've unpacked your question um, using, you know, the tax word, the topic word, you've checked for understanding of difficult words, um, you've checked for the limitation, you've used your research tips and research the documents and use the crap for those you're not sure to check if it's you know relevant or um, academic enough then you want to start planning how you will answer that specific question now this is where i mentioned this a little bit earlier but this is where you now come up with your mind map okay so you can use your mind map to make a linear map for your assignment. So linear maps use um, headings, subheadings, and lists. So um, at this stage, let me just go back. You, I said when you're brainstorming, you can have your mind map. So now at the, once you've brainstormed during this stage, what stage was that? Okay, I think it was uh, developing your strategy where you had to brainstorm. Yeah, at one of the stages, you are supposed to brainstorm, right? And come up with a mind map. So at this stage, now you want to come up with a linear map. So a mind map is more about, you know, you just say, okay, I'll have an introduction, a body a conclusion. There'll be this number of paragraphs. But the linear map, it's where you now kind of with headings and subheadings, you start to write what exactly will be under each section. So you go into more detail about your map. So what's think about the sections you will have, what to include in each sections, what you will include in each paragraph. So here you go in detail. The difference with your linear map and your actual document is that here you will mostly write in sentence form, in, in point forms, you will be listing. But the actual AC or question, you may need to write paragraphs with some cohesion and coherence, right? Linking the sentences to each other and to the topic and to the headings. So with the linear map, you will just list. What do I need in the introduction? In the context, I'll mention this. My thesis will be this. The outline will be this. Paragraph one, the topic sentence will be this. The explanation will be this one reference or two reference, then the concluding. So with each paragraph, you actually do that. And I, one thing um, just to draw your attention to, when you have your mind map, right? When doing your research, please make sure that each paragraph has enough support. So you want to make sure that when you have an article, before you start writing, make sure that each aspect you have chosen has enough articles. Now, there's been instances where a student will tell, will write, and I will be reviewing their work, and then realize that there's a paragraph without referencing. And when I ask, why didn't you provide support for this idea? 
um, some students would tell me, but I supported the other ideas. It doesn't count. You will lose marks for analysis for that specific paragraph. Secondly, I didn't find any article that was, you know, saying anything about this. Um, so I just, you know, improvise. So what I would advise you when you're doing your mind map and just try to make sure that there's articles for each paragraph. Now, if there's one paragraph which you cannot find articles, change it. Let's say you're discussing the positive uh, effects of technology and um, one effect, maybe you decide I'm going to talk about apps and then you go online, you're researching the use of apps and there's nothing. Change it. Use the internet instead of apps. Use um, phones instead of apps. Use, um, you know, um, something else, you know. PowerPoint, YouTube, you know, use anything else instead of apps. So if you're discussing the causes or the consequences, the causes of poverty in Africa, and you decide I'm going to talk about corruption as one major cause of poverty in Africa, then you go online, you're researching uh, corruption as a cause of poverty um, and, you know, or whatever search you put in there. And at the end, you're not really finding a lot on corruption. Or even if it's there, they are not academic sources. So what you do then is you change it. Take another cause. There's so many causes, right? So go for infrastructure. Go for lack of education. Go for political reasons, religious reasons. Go for other reasons that will allow you to get more information to back up your arguments. Because remember, in academics, you always need to back up your arguments with referencing, right? So with your linear map now, you will then include what references you'll be using for that specific paragraph, for each paragraph, how you'll be ending the session. So this is more detail, right? So once you have a detailed writing, now you know, okay, my introduction is this, my first paragraph is this, these are the two sources that I'll be using, the second paragraph is this, these are the two sources that I'll be using and so on. So once your linear map is clear, you now want to start writing. OK, so the linear map, I always say, is like using a GPS to go to a place. You know, the map is there. You just follow the map and you get there. But if there's no GPS or actual map, you know, um, then you have to stop sometimes, ask people for direction. You may get lost. You just take a longer time and you may not have the best route. But if you have your linear map, then you're you're increasing your chances of having a more co cohesive writing, a well-structured writing, right? So once you have that map, you want to free write. You then just use your map to just put down everything on paper. At this stage, you don't want to start reviewing. Don't look at the grammar so much. Don't look at how you are punctuating or the consistency of your referencing yet. Just write, write everything, translate everything, transfer everything from that line, uh, uh, line um, linear map onto your first draft. So just have those sentence forms, paragraph forms, write down everything freely, right? Um, um, get as much information down as possible. So explain when you get to your topic sentence, one short topic sentence, explain as much as you want, then add in your referencing, put the concluding sentence, go to the next, you know, um, then you can start reviewing. Once you've written, you have your references, you have your reference list. Now you can start reviewing your work. Okay. So once you're happy, you can take a break. And this is important for the for this stage. So when writing your assignment, the reason we say start early is because you need a break before you get to the last stage, which is the review stage. So the break allows you to take a distance from your work because you wrote it. So because you wrote it, you may not be able to find a grammatical mistake or see gaps in the structure because you wrote it. But if you give like a day in between or 12 hours in between or two days in between and come back to it, you are looking at it from a fresh perspective. And then you'll be able to really see those areas of gap. You know, you can read your question again. Look at it first, start always with the bigger picture. Have I answered the question correctly? Check the marking schedule, you know, what is required of me? Did I focus on all the major areas that the lecturer is looking for? Is the structure correct? Is it uh, an argumentative essay? Did I follow the structure correctly? 
Do I have my introduction, the body paragraphs, conclusion? Do I have topic sentences, explanation, evidence, conclusive sentences? Do I have my linking devices in between? Does the last sentence introduce the next? So just checking the structure, the cohesion. Um, is everything working? Um, if it's a report, do I have all the necessary requirements? So just checking each session if the flow is smooth, you know, um, have you used your own words, you know, um, when um, including the reference, were you able to paraphrase and summarize appropriately? Did you present it well? You know, um, then after you've checked if you're answering the question and if you 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 are following the appropriate structure and if it's well, uh, it's if there's a logical flow between the ideas, check for grammar. Did you use the appropriate language? Is it academic enough? Is it formal? Is the tone formal? Um, how is the punctuation? How are your tenses? You know, how is the subject verb agreement? Check for the spelling. Use your word spell check first to just minimize any, you know, spelling mistakes. But well check won't pick up everything. The word, 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 word check, sorry, won't pick up all mistakes. So you want to really look at the homonyms, you know, uh, words that are, um, sound the same but look different. Just make sure you set T O instead of T double O. You know, um, check that you use the right language, appropriate um, tone, commas, semicolons, apostrophes. Check all of that. We will do that in the grammar workshop. Then check your referencing next. Um, if you're using the Harvard, is the punctuation correct? Were you consistent? Check your reference list. Did you number the pages? Did you include your title page if it's needed? Um, most lecturers prefer you to have the header where your name and student number appears on each page. In case it gets, you know, um, it's separated or lost, you can still find that student and reattach it. So make sure your student number or if you uh, your name, if you're using names are on each page. Um, then once all the details is there, take another step by asking someone else to have a look at your work. Now, this is very important. Because you wrote it, you may not discover certain mistakes. So swap with a friend who is doing the same assignment, look at each other's work, then help review. So check for the structure, look at the grammar, edit it, and then swap it back, right? You could learn from each other, but this is not plagiarizing, right? It's not about copying another person's work, but you could, Check and see if you know you're answering the question if you're using the right structure. But of course, you will have your different points, right? Of course, a friend that you trust or in a study group where you know you all respect each other and you know work you've been working with each other. Alternatively, if there's no no person that can read your work, even an elder brother uh, or your mom or your dad, right? Someone that can help look at your work, or you can book for a session with Queen, right? Um, whom UNISA has paid to help you look at your assignment. You can send me your assignment book for one-on-one -on -one session and I can go through it looking at your marking guide, you know, looking at the academic aspects. I will check if you've understood the question, if you've answered the question, you know, uh, based on the information you have. I will not mark it. I will not give you a mark, but I can see if you're answering the question. I can look at your structure, your grammar, your referencing. You know, I can double check that. And then we could do it even over two or three sessions, depending on how well you've written your work. And then once you're happy, you can submit your assignment. OK, and that will be the end of your assignment. And you, you know, just don't go back checking for if or marking yourself. Just wait patiently for the mark to come back. All right. So we're going to take a break. We always have 10 minutes break, right? So at 16.18, let's just say 16.20. So at 16.30, so 4.30, or so half past four, we will resume and look at how to prepare for exams and tests, okay? How do you go about preparing for your exams and the tests? So, so far we have looked at um, the reading strategy, the SQ4R. Uh, best ways to get out information from your text. We've also looked at how to write assignments. So from understanding to planning, research, writing, and reviewing. Um, 
now we're going to look at exams and tests. Okay, preparation. So an exam is that formal test that you will be able to um, show your understanding and knowledge of a particular subject in order to obtain your qualification at the end of your studies. Okay, so usually at the end of the year, you will have an exam um, that will, you know, check your knowledge of that specific module, right? So in preparation for your exams, you will want to, number one, get enough sleep. Now, the mistake that students sometimes make with this step is that, um, I mean, up to the exams, they barely sleep, you know, energy drinks, coffee, and you find a student, um, you know, sleeping for like three hours a day, you know, two hours, four hours. Sleep is important because sleep builds memory. So ensure you get enough sleep, especially, you know, uh, the weeks leading to your exam. Try to get eight hours of sleep. Now, you don't want to, to only read, 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 read and not sleep. Sleep helps your brain to rest. And when your brain is rested, it's able to retain more information. So sleeping actually helps you study better. If your brain is tired, you will be reading. But have you ever been in a situation where you read, read, you read the same article again and again, you're reading, but you just feel like you're not understanding, it's not going. It could be that your brain is tired and it needs to sleep. You will see even a computer when it's too heated, it shuts down, right? So your brain needs to rest. So take it as an important strategy to get enough rest as you study for exams and tests because you will be able to build on your memory and retain more information. So you could be sleeping six hours, you know, but closer to the exam, instead of sleeping less, you should sleep more uh, because you want to retain more information. If you can't make eight hours, try to keep it seven, you know, at the least six hours, at least six hours of sleep, okay? Then you want to organize your study space in prep for exam. The study space will have all the material um, that you will be needing for the exam in one place. You know, all the websites you'll be reading, have it um, in, you know, save it in your uh, browser. And then you want to really avoid distractions in your space that you'll be studying. Could be in a library, in your bedroom, but try to minimize those distractions. Keep your phone away when you're in that study space. Um, don't check for emails if you're using your computer. You know, just stay on those study websites. So try to organize that space in such a way that, you know, you, you, you're able to focus as much as possible. Then you also need to think about your study groups, right? So uh, working in groups can be very effective and we'll look at that in our critical thinking, group management, uh, time management and group uh, workshop, right? So we'll look at best ways to form an effective study group because if it's not done appropriately, the study group can become a distraction instead of an advantage. So this is where you organize your study groups, you know, because you can get insight from each other, run ideas with your classmates, teach each other so that you're able to remember more, you know, swap your, your, your summary notes, exchange um, study material and learn from each other. Then you want to really get into the habit of explaining concepts to each other because really teaching is learning, right? Um, so in your groups, you can do this, but also to yourself, you know, just teach yourself, record yourself. If you don't have anyone, um, a friend, a pair, um, a classmate, you know, all of this can help. Just having someone you can explain ideas to is important step in preparation for your exam or boy your younger one right just call them and explain things to them and you know have them think oh are you you know it's something not right with this person um do that uh, practice on past exam papers now this is very important um past exam papers it's not really about cramming Sometimes students take this the wrong way. When you have past exam questions, it's not about I need to cram. This question will come exactly as it is. If you cram the question and, you know, um, you just not, it's not about understanding the topic. It's about just cramming the question. Now, sometimes lecturers keep the same question, but they, they, they rephrase it using other words, you know, um, 
or just changing the sentence structure, but it is the same topic. It is the same question. Just rephrasing it. And if you were about just cramming the question, you will not even realize it's the same question. You will be like, oh my God, I haven't read any of this. Um, why, when you have actually covered those topics. So it's really about the kind of topics that are reoccurring. It's about looking at how the lecturer phrases their questions. Um, it's about looking at how they allocate marks, how they've given instructions in the past. It's about really understanding, you know, the previous exam conditions um, so that you're able to quickly adapt to the current one, right? And as we'll see when we do the addressing multiple choice, this is a really important step because, you know, just redoing those conditions before the actual exam puts you in that state where you will not be surprised. And because that element of surprise sometimes can make you so anxious that you panic and you freeze and you're not able to really do the best in your exam because you, the, you, you, you just got so scared that you didn't write anything or you didn't do your best, right? So you want to avoid that. So past exam questions are truly important. And just check the UNISA um, library or the website to get hold of, you know, some past exam questions. Speak to your tutor, speak to your lecturer to see how you can get hold of some past exam questions. Take regular breaks and get um, you know, some exercise. So when you're studying, there's what we call the Pomodoro technique. It's like every 25 minutes, take a five minutes break. Um, it just helps. Remember, the engine here is your brain. You know, everything has an engine. A car has an engine, you know, a generator has an engine. Uh, the human body, the, our engine is the brain, right? And that is why, um, you know, um, your heart can beat, but you're, you're still, you know, considered what we call a vegetable because the brain is fried, right? So the heart will be beating, but the brain... Basically, you just be lying down there. You will be breathing, but you won't be alive, right? So the brain is our engine. It's the main thing that keeps you alive and, you know, makes you a human being. And it needs rest. It needs rest. It needs, um, you know, to be boosted. And you will get that every 25 minutes when you have that five minutes break, just get a cup of water, a cup of coffee, just stand on your window, look at the, 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 the green or whatever, or just take a step out outside your room, some fresh air for five minutes and then come back. But avoid touching your phone during that five minutes because the phone itself will make your brain even more, you know, busy. You get busier. You know, by you might want to engage on social media, answer a text quickly. No, that is not a break, right? You're, you're not taking a break. In fact, you're making your brain more busy. So you want to really just do nothing during that five minutes. Just get some water and relax, relax, and then carry on. Um, so for a 90 minutes, make sure you have at least 15 minutes break, or you could bring it all in one break, right? So you study for... Um, but two hours is long. Try to get a break every, you know, hour. Try not to go for an hour without a break. It's too long. Just, just get breaks as soon as possible. 25 minutes is ideal, but if you feel it will be a distraction, then every hour try to get a five minutes break or a 10 minutes break every hour. Okay, and then exercising, what it does is it just, it's, it just helps you to keep your brain more alert. Right. So we're not talking about, you know, um, 90 minutes at the gym or two hours at the gym. You can exercise in different ways. You can do some yoga. You can do some stretching. You can take a walk to the park. You can walk your dog. Um, you can, you know, walk your younger one to school. Um, you can do house chores. That's another form of exercising, right? Doing house chores. So just keep your body busy because that will keep your brain busy and keep you more alert and you'll be able to internalize information and understand more, right? And that is a really good strategy to sit for hours, you know, for days and weeks and not exercising. You're minimizing your brain's capacity to retain information. All right. All right. Let's continue. And then snack on healthy food. So healthy food has really shown to boost the brain function. So some research uh, believes that fish can help. Of course, you won't take something that you're allergic to just because you want to boost your brain. Right. Um, 
So just make sure you know you're not allergic to whatever is recommended. But fish has proven to help. Dark chocolate, walnuts, green tea uh, to boost the brain. So avoid sugary foods. These really can just cause an energy and you know slump. So you could after taking sweets, you could think, okay, I'm up, you know, and then down again immediately or quicker. So healthy food is a more sustainable way to really keep your brain active. Then you want to plan your day. So confirm your exam venue, you know, uh, make sure that you have all the necessary details needed for that specific exam, as well as even the way you'll be dressed up. It's winter, you don't want to be in an exam room and you're freezing because what will happen is your brain will be focusing on that cold instead of focusing on the exam paper or that hunger. If you're hungry, you'll be focusing on dealing with the hunger because the brain is like, you know, they have soldiers called neurons that each time you are uncomfortable, it sends soldiers. Please go fight the hunger. If you're cold, it sends soldiers. That's why you start shaking, you know, to increase your body temperature. Um, so if you have headaches, it sends soldiers to try to see if you can calm that down. So your brain is constantly fighting to keep you alive life, right? So if you are writing an exam, you want to make sure your neurons are focusing on that part of the brain of remembering information. So that means you need to make sure you're comfortable, you're warm, you've eaten, um, you've had enough rest, you've been exercising, you know, in that way, your brain can focus on that specific question and then maximize your retention capacity and maximize your pass rate. Okay. Take deep breaths. You don't want to be so anxious that the fear itself becomes, you know, your, your, your failure. So remember, at that stage, you've done your best. You've studied. Um, you've done, taken every step necessary for that exam, or you haven't. But there's nothing you can do at that point. All you can do is write down what you know, right? So be confident. And tell yourself there's nothing I can do right now. All I can do is do my best. So do your best. Take deep breaths. breaths do your best. Put in everything you know on that paper. Follow the steps. Try to remember as much information as you can. Write knowing that you've done your best. And remembering that the path to success is sometimes failure. So sometimes you will face obstacles, challenges, and you learn from them and you become better. Right? So failing or um, have uh, going coming across challenges is a path to success itself, right? Knowing that learning is a process, you may not get it the first time, you may get it the second time. And that kind of positive mindset will just give you that space to be able to relax in your exam and do your best, okay? What you want to do also when you get in the detailed information about the exam, you want to think about the type of questions, you know, what content will be covered in the exam. So speak to your lecturer, speak to your tutor, ask them, are we having multiple choice for this exam or is it essay type or is it both? Are we going to do a research project? Are we going to be writing a proposal? Is it going to be creative writing? What kind of questions should we expect for this exam? What content should we cover? Should we cover from the first semester right up to the to now? Um, is it lecture one, two, three, four? So get a, an, an, an idea of the content, how much you need to read for that exam. Sometimes lecturers will tell you, focus on information from the second semester or from semester one, or look at four chapters and so on. So try to get that information just so that you know what to focus on so that you can really um, um, streamline your effort to what is important, right? You don't want to be reading everything and then at the end your classmates are like, oh no, the tutor said we should read only chapter four. And you spend time that you should be understanding chapter four, reading all three chapters or all five chapters, you know? So get that information prior to your exams, right? What structure will be expected? Is it going to be ACEs? Um, if it's ACEs, um, will it be argumentative ACEs and so on? Uh, will it be re literature reviews? You know, what time allocation uh, for the exam? Will it be an exam all day or um, over five days? You know, try to get a schedule if possible or how it's usually structured. Um, 
and discuss this in your study groups, you know, um, and then you can start with your reading and your learning. OK, um, keep your notes organized as well. So all your mind maps, um, as we'll do on Saturday, how to take notes. So all those forms of note taking, keep them, bring them all together and put them in that study space that we spoke about earlier. OK, and then also go through the course material, right? Go through your tutorial letter, um, you know, um, check the kind of if it will be multiple choice questions or short answers questions or ACES questions, you know, review them prior to the exam as well. I've spoken already about the Pomodoro technique, but it's really about resting every 25 minutes. OK, then remember to look after yourself. Right. So yourself is what will be writing this exam. Right. So you want to take care of yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, no one else can. So um, you are the most important thing to yourself. It's you. It's your body. It's your brain. It's everything about you. So you want to check that you are well. Uh, take care of your diet, exercise, get enough sleep, your emotional well-being, your physical well-being. Just take care of yourself, right? Um, and the day before the exam, you want to make sure you get those eight hours of sleep, okay, before the exam. Bring every material together, your ID, calculators, anything you'll be using. Double check the venue. Um, are you going? Is it uh, online? If it's physical, um, um, what transport are you using? Plan against traffic, um, you know, um, to get there in time and unforeseen circumstances. Think about all of that. And um, when you get there, make sure you're not stressed. And when you're in that exam room, you know, uh, what you want to do is, number one, listen to instructions. Now, this is something that my daughter specifically struggles with. She knows the information, but she never takes time to read the instructions, you know, so um, she just dives in or she reads the instructions half. And she does that even at home. If I'm maybe giving her, I say, um, can you go get me water next to? So she ends at water and I'll say, get me water next to the bed, for example. She will not finish that instruction. So in her mind is get me water. Now, when she gets to the room, she will find maybe water in the cup, water in a bottle, water next to the bed or water on the table. Now she has to go back. Either she'll bring the wrong water or she'll come back and, mom, and say, mommy, which water are you referring to? But I, if she had listened to the instruction till the end, she would have heard me say, get the water next to the bed or in the bottle. So then if you're in an exam and you, you, you don't get the full instruction, what happens is you will fail or you will get half the marks, right? So this was just an analogy, but to say instructions are important. So when you are in the exam hall, please put your pen down. Put everything down once they're giving instructions of how things should be. Listen to the instruction carefully and know exactly what is expected of you. OK, once you've gone through all the instructions, the exam instructions, you've listened carefully. Now read the test through first. So once you have your test paper, or exam paper in front of you, go through the entire test, right? Checking how long it is. Um, reading all parts you're expected to complete, have an estimate of, you know, what you know, what you don't know, you know, and then try to focus, address each question separately. So um, focusing on um, each question when you read the paper, right, uh, have a pencil, highlight those questions that you know, and those questions that you think will be difficult or you will need more time, then try to always start with the, the easiest questions with more mark allocation. Because let's say you, you just start the paper and you just take your paper and you start writing the first, um, you start responding to question one. And right from question one, um, you realize that it's difficult and you take two hours to answer that question. 
And then when you flip through the page, you realize that there's three more questions that are so easy. You've read them, you know them, but now you have 30 minutes left for the exam to end. And now you're panicking because you have 30 minutes and you know all those questions and you took up to two hours for one specific question. That is even maybe just 10% of the entire exam, right? So you've minimized your pass. So what you want to do is to read through the question entire in, in, in its entirety, having an idea of the mark allocation, what is required, ticking the questions that you know with the highest mark allocation, start with those to maximize your pass. Then you can end with the harder questions um, with the lesser mark allocation. So that flow will help you maximize your pass rate. Okay. And then um, what you will then do is remember to relax. And when you're done with your exam, do not just go submit. Okay. Just put your head down, close your eyes, for about five minutes. So taking a step back from your exam, right? And then go back, read the instructions again, read your questions again. Then one question after the other, double check. Did I answer correctly? Did I, you know, um, include everything that was needed? Then review your grammar. Look at your grammar. You know, you may have made some spelling mistakes here and there or forgotten the punctuation or written the wrong punctuation. So take the last few minutes to review your work, right? And once you're ready, you can then submit um, your assignment or exam, right? And for your short answer questions, the same approach. If you have some short answer questions, rephrase the question during the exam. Think about how you will structure it. So maybe, um, how do you want to structure it? And then always think about providing examples and evidence. The map allocation will guide you as to how much you need to write for each question. And then uh, practice short questions as well before your exam. So short questions like, um, um, who, why, why, why is technology important? That is a short question, right? Um, so how do you want to go about answering such such short questions? Okay, and uh, that takes us to the end of our workshop. We have looked at best reading and writing practices. We saw that the SQ4R for survey question, read, respond, record, and review will help you really get out the information from your text. And then the best way to write is to really understand the assignment question, um, plan, research, write, and review. And in preparation for your exams, you need to follow certain steps like exercising, eating healthy, getting enough rest, um, on the, um, um, listening to assignment instructions, and so on, right? And these will really allow you to read more effectively and write more effectively, be it in preparation for assignments, tests, as well as exams. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me and to improve on your academic writing skills. Do you have any questions for me? Tomorrow, we're going to be looking at unpacking questions how do you unpack questions and more study strategies that you can use all right so we're going to be also looking at memory recalling tomorrow so we we, we, we kind of touch on it lightly today but how do you retain information uh, because studying is really about retaining information so what are some of these the strategies that you can use to not forget to retain as much information as possible for your exam so